Good afternoon, welcome, and thank you so much for attending the kickoff for the wonderful On the Same Page program. My name is Jennifer Johnson Hanks. I'm the Executive Dean of the College of Letters and Science, and on behalf of the college and the university, I'm very happy to welcome you tonight. On the Same Page is one of the ways that Berkeley welcomes and engages uh, you in this university's vibrant intellectual community by providing each of our new students with a shared by providing all of our new students with a shared intellectual experience, a work of art to be considered and discussed by all, we open the door to the communal experiences that are the basis of a world-class college education. A strong, supportive campus community allows us to take intellectual risks, to continuously challenge ourselves and the status quo, to learn from one another, and to thrive amidst an amazing diversity of interests origins and perspectives. I want to emphasize the value we place on the diversity of perspectives and being open to them, because the phrase on the same page can be used to connote a desire to arrive at a common shared understanding. That's not what we mean here. We mean on the same page as in we're all looking at the same text, but we're looking at it from a variety of ways. We're seeing it through a variety of different eyes. We want to have a shared experience that foster discussion across multiple perspectives and the opportunity to learn from them. This year's selection was the film Oppenheimer. It was partly filmed on our campus in 2022 and premiered last year. The film went on to win seven Academy Awards, including Best Picture, Best Director, Best Actor, and Best Supporting Actor. The selection committee, made up of faculty, staff, deans, students, and librarians, chose this film because it changed the way that they saw and thought about UC Berkeley and about our campus's place in history and in the world. I hope that after watching the film, you agree. Oppenheimer provides us with all sorts of opportunities and avenues to engage and consider the content in our own ways, which I think you will see with our distinguished faculty panel in a moment. If you have not yet seen the film, you can see it on the big screen for free at BAM PFA this Sunday, September 8th at 1 p.m. The screening is open to UC Berkeley student staff and faculty with a Cal One card. Berkeley student staff and faculty can also stream the, stream the film for free through the UC Berkeley library with your CalNet ID. The streaming link is on the, on the same page website. We have, over the course of the fall, an exciting slate of programming related to the film scheduled uh, throughout the fall in partnership with the Center for Japanese Studies, the Center for Science, Technology, Medicine, and Society, and the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Now, I have the pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Dimitri Brown is Assistant Professor of History at UC Berkeley. He's an historian focusing on modern Native American and indigenous experiences. His current manuscript in progress is a Tewa Pueblo history of the Manhattan Project in Los Alamos, New Mexico. Dr. Brown is interested in the relationship between indigenous and scientific communities and the philosophical overlaps and dissonance between them and in the power and story of place. Catherine Carson is professor and chair of the Department of History at Berkeley. Trained in physics and the history of science at the University of Chicago and Harvard University, Professor Carson joined the Berkeley faculty in 1996. She is author of the groundbreaking monograph, Heisenberg in the Atomic Age, Science in the Public Sphere, and has published widely on the history of 20th century physics and the relationship between science and philosophy in Germany and the United States. John Els is Professor Emeritus in the Graduate School of Journalism at UC Berkeley. He is perhaps best known for The Day After Trinity, J. Robert Oppenheimer and the Atomic Bomb, published in 1980, and The Wonders Are Many, The Making of Dr. Atomic in 2008. He was director of the documentary program at the Graduate School of Journalism from 1997 to 2014. Els, Professor Els is the recipient of the MacArthur Fellowship and is currently completing a book on nuclear testing. Yasunori Nomura is professor of physics and director of the Berkeley Center for Theoretical Physics. He works on theoretical particle physics, cosmology, quantum gravity, and quantum information. His current research foci include the black hole information problem, holographic descriptions of space-time, and multiverse cosmology. Professor Nomura is the recipient of the Alfred P. Sloan Research Fellowship and the Simons Fellowship in Theoretical Physics. He is a fellow of the American Physical Society. Kyoko Sato is Associate Director of Science, Technology, and Society at Stanford University. 
Her research examines techno-scientific governance in Japan and the United States. She co-edited the book, Living in the Nuclear World from Fukushima to Hiroshima, an interdisciplinary post-Fukushima reflection on the development of the global nuclear order. She's conducted fieldwork in various areas affected by nuclear technology, including Fukushima, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and Church Rock, New Mexico, to examine the dynamics and relationships among global and national nuclear governance, expertise, and democratic citizenship. Today's panel will be moderated by Professor Steve Kahn, Professor of Physics and Astronomy and the Dean of Mathematical and Physical Sciences here at Berkeley. Professor Kahn is an experimental astrophysicist and cosmologist. He was the US principal investigator for the reflection grading spectrometer of the European Space Agency's XMMM Newton Observatory, which was launched in December 1999 and is still flying. More recently, he was the director of the Vera C. Rubin Observatory. He is a fellow of the American Physical Society, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Please join me in welcoming uh, Professors Kahn, Brown, Carson, Els, Nomura, and Sato. So thank you, Jenna, for the introductions. And thanks to my colleagues here on the panel for participating. And of course, thanks to all of you in the audience for attending this event. When we chose the Oppenheimer film as our on the same page selection for this year, we did so with the recognition that this is a big film, big in every sense of the word. It is sweeping in its content. It is a film about a charismatic but flawed individual, a Shakespearean tragic hero in many respects. It is a film about physics and about physicists covering the development of quantum mechanics, perhaps the most consequential scientific achievement of the 20th century. It is a film about a momentous event in human history, the development of the atomic bomb and its use, so far the only use, of a nuclear weapon on the civilian public. It is a film about the onset of the Cold War, the rise of McCarthyism, and the development of the military industrial complex. Is it, a it is a film about the growth of big science and the development of the national laboratory system. Oppenheimer is also a story about places. The early parts of the film take place here in Berkeley and make use of iconic images of the Berkeley campus, the Campanile, the building we now call Physics South, but in Oppenheimer's day was called LeConte Hall. Much of it takes place in Los Alamos, a then remote area in northern New Mexico that was home primarily to Native American Pueblo tribes. The latter parts take pl place in Washington, D.C. and in Princeton, New Jersey. The story is deeply affected by these places, and the events depicted had a profound impact on those places. For example, Oppenheimer created the School of Theoretical Physics here at Berkeley, which is now among the leading centers in the world. But he was also strongly influenced by what was already here. The early radiation lab started by Ernest Lawrence, the left-leaning intellectual culture that was centered around the campus. By commercial and critical standards, Oppenheimer was an enormous success. In 2023, it grossed over $977 million worldwide, making it the third highest grossing film of the year overall, the highest grossing film about World War II ever, the highest grossing biographical film ever, and the third highest grossing R-rated film. All of those statistics come from Wikipedia, incidentally. <laughs> it was released contemporaneously with a very different film, Barbie, creating the Barbenheimer phenomenon, where the viewing public was advised to see both films at the same time as a double feature. However, in contrast to Barbie, Oppenheimer was well rewarded at the 2024 Academy Awards, as Jenna mentioned, receiving seven Oscars, including Best Picture, Best Director, Best Actor, and Best Supporting Actor. So our theme for this afternoon's discussion is what is the Oppenheimer film good for? And we use the term good to cover a range of different criteria. Uh, but let's start the discussion with um, a consideration of Oppenheimer as a film. 
And so let me turn to John. Uh, can you comment on your perspectives on the movie? Where did it succeed? Where was it less successful? Thanks, Steve. Um, well, you know, as you were speaking, I, 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 I am looking out at these folks here. I was thinking of the last images in that film, which are cataclysmic. It's an apocalyptic rain of fire encircling uh, the earth. Um, and so I look at these things, I take the long view because I grew up, I was born before the Trinity shot. I grew up during the Cold War, I actually saw an atomic bomb. We thought about that kind of apocalyptic end a lot. So in thinking about the film, I look out at these folks and I look at us and I say, well, this is a great success story. I mean, here we are. We have not blown ourselves to bits. Uh, you know, it's a beautiful afternoon in Berkeley and we can be here to talk about this film. Uh, as um, a movie, uh, I, I'll say a couple of things for the record. I, I liked it a lot as a popcorn movie. I was amazed at Chris Nolan's bold approach to take this incredibly complicated, morally fraught, scientifically fraught, 800-page book, American Prometheus, uh, and in turn it into an IMAX movie uh, that for my money was, I mean, it was a bit too long, it was way too loud, it was certainly flawed in other ways I'll get to. Uh, but Christopher Nolan succeeded in getting Americans and citizens of the world to think about nuclear weapons for the first time in decades, I, I, I expect. I mean, the, you know, the threat of nuclear weapons, of course, is still with us. We still have thousands of these things out there, um, but the public awareness of the threat and the weapons, I think, has subsided. So hats off to, uh, to Chris for doing that. Um, you know, I think there was some astonishing acting in the film, especially from uh, Robert Downey Jr. I think the structure of the film, this wonderful, crazy fracturing of time, uh, was, I mean, a lot of heavy lifting there, and I think he, for the most part, pulled that off. Now, it, making any film about a big subject like this, and I have, I've attacked this subject twice in my career, uh, it's all about the point of view, and the point of view in this movie, in Christopher Nolan's version of this story, and I should hasten to say that, uh, you know, we're gonna, I'm sure, have some criticisms of this, of this film, but this film has already been made. <laughs> we are not, we're not gonna unmake it. And it is, for the moment, the dominant narrative. And it is from a particular point of view that was chosen both by the authors of the book uh, and by the director of the film. And that is the point of view from inside Robert Oppenheimer's head. Uh, and virtually everything in the film, except for the last 10 minutes, is seen through Oppenheimer's eyes. Uh, there, I mean, I look at, at you folks and I see a whole lot of potential policymakers and filmmakers and scientists and those of you who are filmmakers or who are gonna write the next set of books and these stories do need to be told, retold once every generation in a fresh way. Uh, there are plenty of other points of view. There is the most obvious, there is the point of view from a person on the ground in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, the f completely absent from the film, to my amazement when I saw it, uh, was, I mean, the, what happened to human bodies, 200,000 human bodies on the ground in Japan, is completely absent from the film. Now, that's a director's choice, and we can discuss it, but I kept waiting for Hiroshima to happen, and it didn't. So that's a, that's a point of view. There is a point of view of the same story of the Manhattan Project seen from someone in one of the local pueblos, there is a fascinating story uh, from the point of view of Oppenheimer's brother Frank, uh, from the point of view of women at Los Alamos. We'll talk more about that later. Uh, so I'll leave it for there for the moment. I, I think I'm glad. That, I think the world is a better place because the film got made. Uh, I think there are plenty of other films to fill out the rest of this story. Great, thanks John, that's a good introduction and I'm sure we'll come back to some of these themes. Um, let me turn to, to Yasunori now and talk a little bit about physics and physicists. Um, it, most of the general public does not have a lot of direct experience with quantum mechanics or even with, phys with physicists, so this is probably new to a lot of people. Um, I made the comment that the development in quantum mechanics is 
probably the greatest scientific achievement in the 20th century. Um, how do you think the film did in, in portraying that evolution? Yep. Um, hey, I'm a theoretical physicist, so I can't talk about only kind of physics and the physicist side of the movie. And, but I, let me start like a lecture in quantum mechanics to you, which will probably take four, <laughs> four hours and a half or something, but, uh, or 40 hours maybe. But rather than doing that, so I will probably uh, talk about, uh, uh, essentially about the person Oppenheimer, which I was kind of impressed uh, by, uh, by watching the film. And Oppenheimer is, is an interesting character, okay? And while he did a lot of good works, okay, was a certainly top physicist okay, at the time, but it's not like a super hyperstar like Albert Einstein. Okay, nobody can compete <laughs> Albert Einstein. So, uh, but even including Erwin Schrodinger, you may have heard, or uh, Paul Dirac and Max Planck. And in those times, mm, depending on how you view, but it's not really a deep, the top of these people who are all in Europe back then, okay? And he also went to Europe around that time and learned the cutting edge physics called quantum mechanics, which was really revolutionizing your physics around that time, okay? And Steve mentioned that quantum mechanics is one of the, or the biggest uh, achievement in early 20th century, but the other pillar is, it's called reactivity, I would say, and these two are, maybe statistical mechanics, but uh, uh, these two are like really revolutionary. And to just give you kind of feeling that the, uh, what this quantum mechanics is, <laughs> like one thing is that um, uh, this is not historically how that was discovered, but back then I think we started learning that we or any material are made out of atoms. Of course, nowadays even uh, 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 children know. And then uh, that atom, an atom also has a structure, okay? It's not the point. It has a kind of core, nucleus at the center, and there is some electron, some particle floating around, okay? And around end of the 19th century, we thought that Newtonian dynamics, something, some framework of physics completed by Newton in the 17th century, I, I think, a uh, long time ago, and with some electromagnetism, we completed the physics, okay? We totally understood physical phenomenon, and the rest is application of these theories. Okay? Newton mechanics was so powerful and explaining everything, okay? But if you apply this Newton theory onto the atom, which people newly found because of the development of technology, we found that, that this structure, like core of the positive charge at the center, and the and floating around, the particle floating, negative charge floating around, that's electron, is not stable. It cannot exist even according to Newton's theory and Maxwell's theory, which was completed in the 19th century. In fact, it decays and in 10 to the minus 11 second. If you don't know what the 10 to the minus 11 second, that's a point, oh, 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 one second, okay? <laughs> Any atom disappears in that uh, uh, time scale, which was not, okay? So something completely wrong is happening, uh, 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 like in, in, in Newtonian mechanics. And people figure out that uh, the idea that we have, like a physical quantity is all continuous. For example, if you accelerate the car, then it's just continuously the velocity increases, okay? Usually you may think that. But in nature, things are discrete. <laughs> So it's like a 10 kilometer per second, 20 kilometer per second, 30 kilometer per second, jump into 40 kilometer per second. Of course, that's a little bit of, not really precise, but it's something like that. And because this jump was so small that it looks like continuous, okay? And this, this car example is not precise, but you know, it's like that. So it's a completely different physics than uh, people imagined in uh, uh, 19th century. Okay? And that those small things were so important to treat small objects like atom and nucleus. Of course, that will go to the nuclear physics and so on, and then this theme of this uh, uh, movie. Okay? And he brought that to US, 
and he uh, founded uh, the institution at Berkeley, a theoretical, the first essentially uh, cutting edge theoretical physics group in Berkeley. It's still the leading institution, so you can be proud of the physics department, which uh, is under Steve. It's, it's really, really like a top place in, in, in the world. And so the Oppenheimers, let, let me say, let me maybe uh, conclude. I can like tell you the achievement of Oppenheimer, but rather than that, what this movie is good for from physics point of view. You certainly cannot learn really the content of quantum mechanics by just watching it. I hope that's the case, because then uh, I just can send the students to watch a movie and then, okay, done. It's, it's not like that. But you can feel the, the atmosphere back then when the scientist, science is coupled with, say, national security issue or something. Okay? And a very stressed, highly tensioned time. And this is a story of a scientist who struggled to go through those periods. Okay? The, the, the movie will describe all these things. He, uh, yes, he just think about uh, science, the balance of science and consequence. And those are not just a story of the past. Okay? The same thing is happening. Uh, for example, like even in my field, it's called quantum technology. It's really, uh, you may have heard the, the, something called quantum computer. It's a new mechanism of computer. It will solve the problem super fast, okay? And we have only like test quantum computer, not really like a, a commonly usable computer. But if that will be constructed, then you can use this computer to hack essentially entire uh, like bank and credit card and encry encryption and so those things. It would really change the world. World. So then US knows that this cannot be developed first in country other than us, <laughs> okay? And then especially in a country which don't have goodwill. Uh, there is unfortunately some countries. And then uh, so putting a lot of resources, that's precisely it's like deja vu of the Manhattan Project. <laughs> So the way people think, and in those times, what happens, how the scientists have to live, and those things you can just learn by just watching physics. And I was really impressed because I was certainly not real time in my hard time project time. <laughs> I'm not that old. But I, I fed that and then think back to me what I would do if, if I, I were in the, in the same situation. <laughs> so uh, yes, yeah, some of you may be policy maker and so on, so I think, I suggest you to watch film and think about what you would do in a similar situation. And that's the only thing I can probably tell you. Good, thank you, Yasunari, that was great. Um, okay, well, of course, this is primarily a historical drama. Um, and in constructing such a film, of course, there are myriads of choices one makes about what to include and what not to include. John has already alluded to this. Um, so let's turn to our historians. Um, first, Catherine, um, what's your view of how accurately the film or, or the choices the film makes with respect to the history of the day? Thanks, Steve. That's a great question. Often, human lives and human stories are at the center of history, just like that. They're, they're at the center of this particular film. So one of the things that the film and the discipline of history do so well is take a human being and their choices and work around them. The person who's at the center of the film Oppenheimer isn't simply an abstract, isolated individual. They are someone who fits into a set of patterns and fits into a context. And both of those moves to identify patterns and identify context are something that both this film in its interestingly surprising way and the discipline that I come from take very seriously and in fact do quite well. So if we ask what is the film good for, it's first of all good at letting us see this iconic, charismatic, and stereotypical individual as part of a set of patterns. What do I mean by that? Um, the Oppenheimer who's at the center of this film is explicitly not just himself. He is also invoking 
um, metaphors of Prometheus or of Faust, or you mentioned Shakespearean dramas. The, the life story that the director has chosen to put at the center is not only an individual, but also an archetype. And looking for those patterns and recognizing them and critically diagnosing them is one thing that a historian immediately goes to. This pattern of the tortured genius facing moral challenges is one that, uh, I, I teach the human context and ethics of data for data science. And I watch my students also imagine themselves and watch contemporary figures at large, whether it's Sam Altman or Elon Musk imagining themselves into the figure of this heroic individual. So one thing the film does, sometimes against its own grain, does very well, is to help us see the archetypical and sometimes stereotyped features of our focus on that individual man at the center, believing that his own moral choices are what should guide the future of the world. Which brings me to context, another thing that the film actually, to my eye as a historian, does beautifully well, especially for the post-World War II period. Um, what struck me as novel and eye-opening to me as a historian who has worked on this for decades was putting Oppenheimer not so much in the context of Los Alamos, I think John had done that for us, <laughs> with his own film, which was deeply transformative for me when I saw it earlier in my own career when I was thinking of becoming a physicist. But Oppenheimer, the film, does it particularly well in the context of Louis Strauss, which you pointed to Robert Downey Jr. is just an amazing portrayal of what Oppenheimer did not realize he was up against underestimating the power of the military, underestimating the power of politics, believing that he as a scientist, like other scientists like Niels Bohr, could see their way and bring a new scientifically inspired truth about politics. And then Oppenheimer, the film, so completely cuts the ground out from under that, that assumption that that a scientist or a set of scientists thinking on their own could see their way through this deeply political dilemma. So one of the things the film does is put Oppenheimer the individual into this context in a way that makes clear that he was so deeply in over his head in things that he thought he understood and didn't. To me, that was revelatory about the film. Yeah, as Truman says, uh, keep that crybaby away from me <laughs> in the film. Um, okay, let's talk a little bit about Los Alamos, um, Dimitri. So this is a very interesting place, a very unique place, both before and after the Manhattan Project. Um, tell us a little bit about, you know, the untold story of Los Alamos. Thanks, Steve. Um, it's an honor to be here on the panel. I've really enjoyed hearing, hearing my fellow panelists' comments. Um, I want to answer that by picking up on something Catherine said at the very end um, about Oppenheimer's head, over Oppenheimer's head. Uh, there's, a, there's a moment in the film, there's a scene in the film that I think is very important that I think hasn't necessarily received as much attention as it ought to. Um, and that scene is after the, it takes place in Los Alamos in the Fuller Lodge. Um, he's giving a speech celebrating the success of the atomic bomb. And behind him as he's giving this speech to a, a rowdy auditorium who are cheering and stomping their feet, uh, behind him is a pot that you see for a very few brief seconds, but it's right behind his head. It's right. It's hovering over him as, as his, as he's giving this speech. It's a Tewa pot. It's a Tewa pot made in the 1940s. It's a Tewa Pueblo pot. 
Um, those are the indigenous Pueblo communities that surrounded Los Alamos. Um, and in that pot, there are two American flags sticking out of it. Uh, and I think that that image of a Tewa pot behind Oppenheimer's head with two flags sticking out of it, there's a world there. There's an entire history there. It's not told, you know, it remains untold. Um, in the movie, and yet it's there. Somehow, this 1940s table pot made it onto the film at this really important moment when Oppenheimer's entire psyche is crumbling, and he's, it's at this, this moment, too, where he's imagining the victims of his creation. He sees kind of flesh tearing apart, and he sees a charred corpse that he steps on. Um, it's in his imagination, it's in his head, and yet this pot is also behind his head, um, and there's an eerie parallel, I think, between that pot behind his head that represents so much of what is whole and special and rooted in place in the table world, in the table pueblos, an eerie par parallel between that pot with the two flags sticking out of it behind Oppenheimer's head and, this, and the charred corpse that he ends up stepping on, the black vessel, black vessel, one is shattered, one remains whole, um, there's, there's so much to say about untold, what is untold, what's left unsaid, what is silent in the film. There are so many silences in the film. There are so many perspectives um, that, that one day will be shared and told. Um, but what's really fascinating to me is how those stories somehow ended up in the film. Um, and there are ways we can see glimpses and pieces of those and, and begin to develop and flesh out those stories uh, for ourselves. Yeah, that's great. And actually, that's a great segue to my next question, which is for Kyoko, which is um, the treatment of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in the film. So I think John already mentioned that um, there's no footage of Japan in the film. Yes, um, uh, thank you. Um, yeah. So that's one of the biggest critiques in Japan, and how people receive the film. It's like, why is the, you know, the, the human consequence is completely missing, right? And then also when that scene, uh, you know, the, the Dimitri you mentioned, the damage is kind of imagined through the audience who are white people, right? And then that was also considered deeply disturbing to people in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, their families, the survivors, and then, so the idea that messy, you know, the consequences of the bombing is only told in that kind of like illusion, you know, but also I think there is a scene where uh, they describe the actual gory details of what the bomb does in the film, and he, uh, Oppenheimer winces, but there's no actual visual imageries. And then I don't necessarily think we need to know all of that things in the, you know, the film, but if you just Google, for instance, what the bomb does, it's really, really messy. It's not an instantaneous death. And then the abstractly thinking about the, the casualties numbers really, really misses the point of all these people who survived and then died five days later or 10 days later, or, you know, two years later. So it's, it's just a long-lasting, enduring consequence of the bomb that's not really there in this three-hour film was one of the things that uh, Japanese people talked about in the media and then all these events. I participated in many discussion, you know, like sessions, and then that's one of the things that kept coming. But also, survive, including, you know, even people, you know, who are survivors and who are survivors' families, some of them, like you said, John, were really happy that uh, the awareness of this issue was raised because nobody seemed to have cared. And then in this country, like, most people are not aware there's an international treaty, nuclear ban treaty, that many countries have signed on. There's a discussion about, for instance, the accountability of the bombing. Was it actually, you know, international, you know, internationally, like a, the acceptable thing? Because right after the bombing, the Japanese government actually complained and, you know, brought the case and said you know, to, to Swiss government, saying that 
this is against humanitarian, you know, like kind of like a goals we have. And so that kind of things are all missing by just telling a story in a very abstract way. And then uh, they still did a great job of like showing, for instance, there are scientists who are against the idea of the use of the bomb. It was not a unanimous thing. There's also uncertainty uh, scientists worked with. For instance, that they were not 100% sure the chain reaction could be contained. <laughs> and then, the, so you see the mechanisms of the messiness of science and technology making, and then how the you know, personal and then national politics go into the making of those things. So those things I thought were uh, really kind of fascinating to see. Yeah, actually, I just want to follow up a little bit on that. I had the occasion of visiting the museum in Hiroshima, which is, for those of you who have never done that, I strongly recommend that if you have the chance to go to Japan, partly because you get a very different impression than, to some degree, we're allowed to have in the US. So one of the most interesting um, elements that I saw in that museum was a collection of correspondence that they had in Washington about the decision to drop the bombs, which I'd never seen in the US. And it is not in the US museums. So, and, and some of you may know the Enola Gay um, exhibit in the Smithsonian. There was a controversy when actually a former chancellor of Berkeley made the decision to write a narrative about Enola Gay that was not entirely, you know, this was a wonderful achievement. So somehow, 80 years later, we still have issues in the US about dealing with this event. Maybe John or... or one yeah, of I, I mean, as a documentary maker, I'm fascinated by this because the scene that you mentioned, there's a, for those of you who haven't seen the film, there's a scene after the bombing of Hiroshima where the scientists, including Robert Oppenheimer, are in a, a big auditorium uh, in Los Alamos, and they're watching a slideshow. And off camera, a scientist is describing what's on the screen, and he's describing uh, what it's like on the ground in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And we can see off screen, out of focus, we can see that the slides are changing but we're not allowed to see them. Uh, and instead, what the director chose to do was to stay on close-ups of Oppenheimer. Now that's in, in whatever the reasons for Mr. Nolan making that choice, it's very, very much in keeping with the entire history of filmmaking, certainly, and to a great degree, book writing about this. I mean, all of the, the early films about um, the Enola Gay and Second World War and Hiroshima, the bombing is seen from a bomber's eye view. I mean, there's a gap between the actor and the act. When the American forces went into Hiroshima and Nagasaki within a few weeks after the bombing of the surrender, uh, one of the first things they did was to confiscate all of the imagery. I mean, there were a number of Japanese photographers, very good photographers, two of them actually, who were in Nagasaki and uh, Hiroshima. And those, those, they're like the Goya, you know, horrors of war. I mean, they're amazing. Photographs. Those were withheld from Americans. Uh, the first batch came out in not really in, until about 1979, when we were making the day after Trinity. We got some of the first, and then the final, the last batch that I know of was all uh, color footage of victims in Nagasaki, and that wasn't declassified and released until uh, 1995. So this is this is nothing new, and it, it permeates. All, however well intentioned, it permeates almost all of the storytelling. By the way, in the book, there is no mention of the bombing of Hiroshima. It's a half a sentence, which surprised me for such a good book. <laughs> then, by, by the way, I have a question. Then, is it, is it okay? Yes. Um, so it's true that uh, uh, obvious criticism is that uh, uh, the bombing, consequence of bombing, like vict victims, are not described. Uh, in the movie uh, a lot, that's true. But still movie described this event of dropping a bomb, not as like a victory, a US ended uh, uh, World War II, it's in a you know, controversial way. Okay? And I think that's really, it, uh, I have a question with, uh, you guys. is it, do you think it was possible 20 years ago to, to do that? 
because a lot of people who actually fought at the World War II, yeah, for them, they bet their life, and then uh, uh, Nazi uh, uh, Germany and also, you know, Japan and uh, Italy and Germany, and they fought, and they really believed at least uh, for all the generations, saying that oh, this bomb was necessary, again, putting uh, the truth aside. But then, is, was, that, was that possible back then? Well, I'll, uh, Catherine can probably speak better than I can. I was talking with Carl Van Bieber recently that both of our fathers were in the armed forces at that time. Uh, and may, we may not, might not exist. You know, I'm, I'm not going to relitigate that whole decision about uh, dropping the bomb. But, um, yeah, 20 years ago, you know, it was one of those questions that when we were making the day after Trinity 40 years ago, it wasn't really on the table. What was what you could discuss was the possibility of a demonstration of the bomb, you know, drop it in Tokyo Bay, which would have made it been a hell of a warning shot. Yeah, it's worth pointing out. So th this struck me in the film. I mean, the classic explanation is always if we had invaded Japan, the number of lives lost on both sides would have been larger, or whatever. But it's stated in the film in a very racist way, which is the Japanese will never concede. You know, this is the character of the people. If we were to just demonstrate the bomb, Japanese will not concede. And that's another element to it, which is kind of adding insult to injury in some sense as a justification for killing 200,000 people. I'm intrigued by your question in part because having taught here at Berkeley for nearly 30 years, I have never found it impossible, I mean, at all challenging to open up these deep questions about choices and decisions and racism and the conduct of war. And my job as a historian is never to resolve them for my students, but it's simply part of coming to grips with the multifaceted reality, and that has, you know, over the 30 year career that I've had here, I have never felt that it's not discussable. But in Berkeley, <laughs> it's just a it's best why this place. is a special place, yeah. <laughs> but I, I think what I'd like to do to historicize it is say many things about how American society talked about. World War II, Hiroshima, and Nagasaki have changed over time. For me, there's a crucial turning point that happens in the 1980s in the context of anti-nuclear movements that are coming out in that last decade of the Cold War when, the, when it becomes completely no longer taboo to talk about the destruction that will be visited, in this case, on, on Americans. And I think John and I both remember growing up, and I, I remember um, making decisions about where to go to graduate school, assuming that I would not live to age 25, because either I would go to Cambridge, Mass, and a hydrogen bomb would wipe it out, or I would you know, go to Chicago, and the same thing would happen. That removal of the uh, taboo of talking about it through our focus on ourselves, yeah. actually freed up a range of discursive moves that weren't, in my experience, there before. We're going to go to questions, but I want to just come back to Dimitri for a, a minute. So the effort and the test at Trinity also had a big effect on New Mexico and on the population. Could you, could you say a couple of words about that? Um, I actually can't say as many words as I would like to about that because the Trinity test took place outside of the table world, which has been my major focus. It took place a few hours south, um, sort of central New Mexico, central western New Mexico, uh, away from Los Alamos, away from the table pueblos. Uh, but there were certainly reports that, I mean, that's part of what is not in Oppenheimer as well, the stories untold, um, the stories of the downwinders in that region of New Mexico who experienced fallout from the Trinity test uh, and have suffered health consequences because of it and who are still fighting to receive uh, compensation for 
those tests. John, you might know more than I do. I know on this. Tina Cordova is, uh, they're organizing out there and they've been locked in lawsuits for decades. Um, it should be noted that a lot of the other downwinders in southern Utah have been compensated for damage from fallout from testing in Nevada with the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act in, I don't know, 1990, something like that. But not the Tularosa downwinders. Well, this has been great, but we do need to move to questions. So there are uh, microphones, and I can't really see with the lights, but there are microphones in the back. So if you have questions for any of the panelists, um, please come forward. Oh, let's start over there. Um, hi. So something that I found interesting in the movie is for the second act, they focus a lot on this, uh, the whole world blowing up essentially with one bomb, this uh, uncontained chain reaction. But they never consider what happens if they succeed of the future that we live in now where uh, we have these states with the power to destroy the whole world. Um, with the push of a button. And something that I'm considering is what is that parallel with what are we not considering now? So there's a lot of talk about AGI and um, LLMs and all, all of this very scary futuristic stuff, but what is it that we're not considering right now? Yeah, um, let me start. Maybe someone else picked that up. So... Um... Uh, you do see some of this in the film, and the, the difference, which is alluded to, but I don't think emphasized enough, between the so-called super, the hydrogen bomb, and the atomic bomb, um, is a very substantial difference. And that was recognized, because you can calculate it on the back of an envelope, um, by the physicists discussing it. So. You know, presumably Oppenheimer's reticence, and you can see his uncertainty about whether to enable or allow research on the super, which he did, without somehow endorsing it and then trying to get uh, the development of it suppressed, not because of its implications for destroying the whole world, but because it would take away research dollars from work on fission which is a funny argument. But I, I do think that that discussion, which was portrayed well, as Catherine said, about the Cold War era and coming to grips with this sort of world-destroying power, did create a change among the public in terms of how we think about it, which in my mind gives rise to the current discussions about AI and machine learning and LLMs, et cetera. So, I think it, it wasn't there pre-Manhattan Project it, and, and maybe post-Manhattan Project uh, in the 50s, but I, I do think it is a part of our thinking now, although, although maybe not as directly as Catherine said, where you wondered whether you would make it to age 25 <laughs> or not. Well, I'd actually find it interesting to speak directly to your question about AI and LLMs and AGI. Because if you take the templated narrative of the scientists who have the secret that they imagine could destroy the world with no one knowing, that template is directly translated from the pre-Trinity story of will we ignite the atmosphere to AGI? Will Ilya Sitzkever or will, the, will Sam Altman come up with the thing that will wipe us out? Exactly because it's so templated, so familiar, I think your move is exactly right to look for the less spectacular stories, the ones that are perhaps less charismatic to think about and more likely to impact huge numbers of people's ordinary lives over the near term and decades, i.e. the challenges and the harms that are in, in in, sort of wrapped up in uses of artificial intelligence now, that when you focus solely on the most spectacular and charismatic story, in part because we have a narrative template in our mind of where to look, 
you can be distracted from looking at the things that seem more mundane and ordinary, but are in fact operating at work. So um, I think you have a very good instinct to ask that question. Can I piggyback on that? So I think uh, one of the things that film didn't show is also something like uranium miners, right? Like uh, actually their body gets exposed to radiation. Mining uranium that's gonna be used or workers at the nuclear sites, people who have to decommission the sites, people who does, you know, decontamination. All these workers and labor is not really thought of when you focus on the genius of a scientist. It's the same way with AI. Who are the, you know, the, the workers? Who's, who are doing content moderations or, you know, the AI and then all these the digital media issues? Where is the, you know, labor? Where is the, for instance, the, the you know, the, the mills that actually cool the, all the, you know, the, the computing systems and what is the environmental consequences? So what we focus on as this innovation also has this vast networks of people and things. And then that's something that was missing in the film and then we also tend to miss in thinking about this, you know, this spectacular innovations. Just one th it's clear that uh, the coming up with the question like that you had is precisely what this movie is good for. <laughs> so <laughs> it's just, uh, it's a good thing. Could I jump in real quick? Sorry, Steve. Sure. Um, I really appreciate that question. I think that you may know this already, and maybe this is why you're asking, but Sam Altman, founder of OpenAI, is among those who did not, or who tweeted in disfavor about the film, hoping that it, he thought that the film might inspire the next generation of physicists. You know, kids would watch this film and become physicists, and that would be great in Sam Altman's eyes. Uh, and the film didn't accomplish that from his perspective. Um, I also think, relatedly, that um, many of these physicists, many of the scientists who took part in the Manhattan Project, reflecting on it, expressed the idea that they felt caught up in this technological momentum, this sort of almost superhuman force of being wrapped up in something that was exciting and you're building towards something and working towards something that feels everything else just kind of fades away, other concerns, and I think that knowing that and recognizing those concerns and those reflections and just the very simple sort of, it's okay to stop, it's okay to think, it's okay to breathe. I, we're, I, we're all caught up in so much new right now, technology, um, and just stopping and pausing is really okay and can open up alternative possibilities. Yeah, I, I would just like to emphasize this last point. So I think one thing that this film did convey, as, as Dimitri just referred, was the excitement of the scientists, particularly the young scientists in the project, even those who had grave reservations about what they were doing, you know, the, the Chicago team, the signers of the Zillard letter. And, you know, as a physicist, you can sort of see it because while the, the physics behind the bomb um, was actually fairly new, but reasonably well understood at the time, whether or not you could do it was the pressing thing. We and had yeah, we had no idea, and, and, and it was mostly theorists that are portrayed in the film. But the detailed questions there were actually not the theorists. They were the metallurgists, they were the shock physicists, they were people who were less connected to quantum mechanics. And, and I see the same pattern with, with the AI research today, that it, what's driving it so much is like, what is it possible for us to do? That's such an overriding force that even when people have moral or intellectual reservations about it, it's hard to suppress that. So I do think it repeats itself. Yeah, I mean, for me, the big question when I began making films about this is one that Nelson Nori brought up, well, what would I have done? And uh, I grew up, you know, with a hatred of atomic weapons. You know, we were diving under the 
desks at school. We were going to die any minute. There was a rocket that had our name on it. I thought they were just evil incarnate. And yet, getting to know these folks and understanding that we were in a war against, we have to remember that this bomb began as an anti-fascist weapon. We were in a war against the Nazis. But you know, you have a chance to go to this exotic mesa, this sage scented mountain, the magic mountain, Bob Wilson called it, and do this groundbreaking physics uh, and, you know, and, and make sure the good guys win. I'm sure I would have been on the next train to Los Alamos. Uh, and it sort of troubled me. Uh, whether how I would have behaved on the target committee after Hitler had been defeated, you know, well, we'll never know. I hope I would have done the right thing. Yeah, and um, well, let me just close with a couple of comments. First off, um, I hope you enjoyed this session. Um, uh, this is a very big topic, as we talked about, and there'll be uh, lots of follow-up in individual classes that you may be taking. Um, please go to the On the Same Page website, and you can see a list of events uh, beyond this initial meeting that are scheduled to discuss this film. Um, we do have uh, a reception uh, outside, so please join us for that. Uh, and let me just take this opportunity once again to thank our panel and to thank all of you for coming.